I always, anytime I'm involved with uh, anything that has to do with NAFP, and it's always a pleasure uh, and really a privilege to be asked, I start out by telling you my personal impressions of NAFP and why we're glad you're here and why we hope you'll continue to support NAFP everywhere it goes. Um, I've been in the business 34 years now. I've gone to every NAFP since uh, I started, since, uh, except for one. And uh, I took, yeah, it's not on. Testing, testing. Mine is on. Hi. Anyway, uh, I would say that um, my view of this business and certainly what success I've, I've been blessed with has had a lot to do with NATPE and the friends I've made here and uh, the, the things I've learned at NATPE. So uh, if you're not as involved in NATPE as perhaps the organization uh, needs you to be, we want you there. We want you in Miami in January, <laughs> you know, tough sell, um, especially if you're from the Northeast as Peter and I are. So at any rate, uh, that's my plug for NATPE, but also for the, the people at NATPE, uh, starting with Rick, Jordan who organized tonight, and Denise and Beth, and, and uh, Wayneston's out there, and Maria's over there, and I know I'm missing five or six people, so Janine's over there. I, so uh, anyway, great people, Rick Feldman, uh, this is his life, it's passion. And if his passion is nappy, that means his passion is television and the people in it. So uh, pick up on it and pay it forward, if you will. Um, I, I'm real happy <laughs> to do this. And you'll notice the, the name of, the, of our session tonight is called Quit Whining and Sell Your Show. Uh, clearly a, uh, a marketing ploy on our part. But really, uh, we, the three of us attend a lot of these uh, conferences, markets, uh, conventions, what have you. And when questions start coming up, we start hearing things like, how do I get them on the phone? Why is this that way? And so we decided to just hit it head on tonight. And for those of you who are joining us on the web, and that's kind of a cool thing, um, you will be, uh, we're encouraging your questions. So if you just IM them to us right at, on the screen there, uh, we'll be sure to include them today and we'll have a lot of time for your questions too. Um, uh, let me just introduce our guys and have them sort of uh, tell their biography. To my immediate left is a gentleman I've had the privilege of working with for a number of years now. We've invested in his programs. He has been producing programs for a long, long time, all independently. John has uh, not been beholden to anyone else, and to be an independent for that long in this business and still be relevant is why John is here today. So John Bird, welcome, and tell us a little bit about yourself, Thank if you, you will. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Um, Bird Productions has been around for almost 50 years. My father started the company, and um, he originally did uh, travel shows and nature shows, and then I got involved when I was 14, went on a trip to Africa, and just immediately fell in love with the business. So I've been in it for a long, long time. Um, we've done things for just about every uh, broadcaster, including all the three major networks, which are now no longer the major networks, because now cable's taking over everything, but uh, done stuff with Discovery from its inception, and WeTV, Nat Geo, just about everyone. Um, the, the landscape, I think, is changing, and I think we were just talking earlier that people do whine about w how do you get in and what do you do, and I have to tell you from a producer, the whining starts after you get the deal, because then you have to figure out how to produce it. And, and how to build a business. And how to build too. a business, absolutely. Um, because, you know, sometimes it's like doing business with Walmart. Good news, bad news, you know. <laughs> Peter Hamilton, thank you for joining us all the way from New York. Uh, Peter has had a history in this business like few others. He's been on almost every side of the desk, uh, including the delivery of the desk. He was a mover. <laughs> At any rate, here's Peter Hamilton, folks. Uh, thank you, Gary. It's an honor to be here. Thanks for NatPe for having us. Well, I used to work at um, CBS. I was in CBS Enterprises in the 80s, and uh, we were studying the, uh, the ratings book, and we noticed our ratings start to slip, and we saw these little cable and satellite channels start to get little blips. Uh, on the um, on the printouts, and um, so things got opportunity started to be constrained at CBS, and I launched my own uh, programming. Uh, sorry, my own consulting firm, Peter Hamilton Consultants, which assisted.
cable and satellite channels in their early business, uh, de in their business development. And one of my first clients was this little network from Landover in Maryland with 35 employees called Discovery. And uh, I was blessed with working on their international business plan, their production business plan, their home video and publishing business plans. And from there worked with many of the other factual channels um, uh, like Nat Geo, A and E, uh, Scripps, Smithsonian, and others. And my focus has always been on the the development of these networks and their ancillary businesses. And then, about um, at the beginning of this year, based on all, all that experience, I published an electronic newsletter called DocumentaryTelevision.com. And the aim of DocumentaryTelevision.com is to provide information about the underlying business of the documentary and factual business. What people are paying for programs, under what terms, and so on. And uh, my newsletter's flown out of the box, uh, thankfully. I'm, I'm, I'm really enjoying our progress, and I'm you know, pleased to be able to serve the industry in this way. I think that's a real good point. Uh, there's a, a lot of people running around at, at NAPI events or any event, and uh, we're all, we, we would all like to make a living in this or any business. <laughs> but um, Peter, in particular, is one of those uh, driven by altruism individuals that our, that our business needs so much. Uh, let, me, let me give a couple minutes on our companies. Uh, Cable Ready has been around 18 years as of a month ago. Uh, we develop and distribute television programs to cable networks in the US. As a distributor, we sell programs around the world. You know us for Women Behind Bars, which uh, John produces for WeTV. We have Inside the Actors Studio on Bravo, Forensic Files in its 15th season on True TV. Uh, you may have seen Monster Quest on History. That's all one of ours. And Intersections, which is the first Cable Ready produced program on Speed. So um, we do that too. Um, and that's through our Cable Ready Productions arm, which really is duplication and materials and we uh, assist on the marketing, putting together your teaser tapes and that sort of thing. And uh, first and foremost for this conversation is Cable U, which is the, indus the industry's only uh, analytical tool for understanding cable networks. Peter covers a lot of things. Uh, what we also add to that, we enhance uh, what someone like Peter does with our exclusive analysis based on Nielsen numbers of the cable network. The networks are going to tell you what they want you to know. Uh, we just try to level the playing field with that. So it's our analysis that really has brought us together with you today, as well as our, our experience in, uh, in helping producers, particularly small independent ones. Um, we're in town, uh, in addition to this, for a conference that's going on down in Santa Monica, the West Dock Conference. More reality, you know, that sort of thing. You could make a living out of going to those kinds of things <laughs> if it paid anything. Or at least uh, eat well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. It was not bad food. It wasn't bad food, um, yeah. At any rate, guys, what was, uh, what was your impression of, you know, the, the dozens of people running around there and producers and buyers and so on? Well, my impression was it was just dozens of people rather than hundreds of people, and I think Natby is a, a much bigger venue, a, a much better place to meet folks. Mm -hmm. Peter, how about you? Um, yes, I would, I would agree with that. I would say that uh, I had some excellent conversations there, and the most interesting conversations to me were about uh, emerging distribution strategies and emerging financing strategies for film and TV from younger people than myself who really aren't on the other side of that divide and do really understand social networking, crowd financing, and all these tools. And there were people there that aren't just talking about it, they're doing it to fund their activities. And I found that, I found it aged me a bit, but I found it really, <laughs> re really fascinating. Can we not, can we have a moratorium on age jokes up okay, here today? Okay, that's it for that. <laughs> I'm the youngest. Just want to point that out. Um, you know, I, Peter, I've thought about all these, these, uh, new media, let's lump it all under new media. And my experience has been, if anyone knew how to make money in it to a great degree, I mean, they'd kind of be doing it, right? Or do these producers see, them as, see themselves as pioneers 
toward a new business model? Uh, I, th I think they do, and I think uh, they are actually proving that uh, for certain categories of programs. Right. I mean, there was a, a guy there who had created a, se a series of programs about uh, choppers, about um, motor motorcycles. And he had built a distribution platform that, was, that had attracted other marketers and merchants, not only of video, but of other services that related to choppers. And he was definitely making a very good living after not so many years. And he did all of this through understanding um, uh, web marketing. Okay, what we'd like to do is sort of uh, uh, give you a little waltz through what's going on and what guys like us, uh, and you have a distributor, a producer, and how would you describe yourself? What's the good umbrella name for Peter, the, the elevator pitch? I'd say a senior, a senior consultant to the industry. <laughs> yeah, we got to work on that. <laughs> senior consultant to the industry. Senior consultant. Yes. Yeah, I remember, Peter. Yeah, it sounds like it's your, uh, your final lunch. Um, you got 104 years of experience up here, so we're going to try and share this with you. Um, John, let's start with you, because uh, without the program, the idea, nothing starts. What powers your development? efforts? Well, I think the uh, coming up with the idea, of course, is a big thing, but it's how you take that idea and then turn it into something that's saleable. Um, and that is, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, we primarily use one sheets and proposals and, and demo tapes and sizzle tapes and teaser tapes. But <clears throat> for the independent producer, the, the, the guy that's trying to look to find uh, a, a cable venue to go to with his project, he's, he's got to find a partner. He can't just go in there by himself. He needs to find a partner. We, we were talking earlier, whether it's an agent or whether it's a production company, to go in and sell the idea. Yeah, if you, if you don't have any kind of a track record, uh, it's best to ally yourself with someone who does. And, and if, if you don't, the, the network itself will probably assign a production company or a showrunner to, to help out with that, too. And if that, that'll be the moment you lose control. Exactly. It'll be that so exact if you go, moment. <laughs> if you go in married to a company, then and that company has a relationship with, with the end user, uh, it, it's much easier because you're not by yourself, and they've got that track record. The, the network uh, trusts them to deliver the show. So you're not a newbie. John, as you're talking about these networks, now we're going to throw it to you, Peter, because you have some, some uh, data to share with us today and your analysis of it. Um, the, the number one complaint, anytime you see a programmer speak, it's this or something like this. People say, uh, well, how should we pitch you? And they always say, the buyers will say, well, you know, watch our network. And, and wouldn't that be like a big duh, you know, <laughs> like watch the network? Um, but the second thing you need to do is know all about that network. That's what Cable U does. That's what Peter does. So Peter has some sort of exclusive information to share with you folks today. Peter, I'll turn it over to you for a while here. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, so I'm just going to advance. I'm yeah, sorry, I went one too many. Um, well, you can look right over there. OK. okay. Um, so this is documentarytelevision.com. It's a weekly newsletter. And for instance, this particular post was one of my most popular ones was about own the Oprah Winfrey network. Is their documentary club a game changer for documentary producers? I got terrific readership on, on that. And my mission is to address this vast industry of factual TV. And um, I mean, I just did some back of envelope numbers and threw this spreadsheet together. And, and, and I was running over two billion in spending on 2009 premieres in the United States alone. So this market has scale. And any market that has scale you know, has, has hope, has opportunity for the right project. And that number is up in 2010. And without going into the details, you can see that Discovery and A&E are the major players. And then there's some you know, net, uh, Scripps Networks, a lifestyle, uh, a, a lifestyle family of networks, uh, produces channels at a lower price point, but still hundreds and hundreds of hours. So this is a big scale industry. And what's really interesting to me is that unlike other industries of a similar scale, very few people actually knew what the underlying costs were. They weren't communicated. They just weren't out there. And so, I mean, why was that the case? And the only explanation I have is that the, the 
origins of documentary and factual television were in the public television or uh, public television systems in the UK, for instance, and in the States, and also with the networks. And a gentleman from Oxford would call a lady from Cambridge who worked at the BBC, and they'd agree on a couple of specials, and no one would bother to really talk about money. So our mission has been to expose some of the underlying dollars. And I don't see the Rainbow Group up there. I did not. Yeah, they're the on the next page. Like that's a, no. Oh, okay. This page, this page goes to the to the right about six. You know, six more networks. There's right. ESPN. You know, the sports channels. There's news channels. There's the Smithsonian. Yeah, the Smithsonian Channel are in there. So it goes. I'm actually surprised it's that big of a number for Smithsonian. Yeah, I think uh, it's probably a, a little less than that right yeah. now, but close to it. It would round at twenty. Good for them. Anyway, and then there's the weather. Sure. All right, so so each network has a budget, and the budget uh, uh, d the budget actually drives what we call a sweet spot. And a sweet spot is that budget area that a network uh, that a network a, a mid-level network executive is comfortable pre presenting to their boss for a project. They know they're not going to get fired if they come in recommending a production at a certain budget level. If it's a couple of hundred thousand degree, uh, dollars or more higher than that number, then questions will be asked about the competence of the, um, of the development executive. Yeah, if it's a planet Earth or a right. America, the story of us, or the game changes. The game, the yeah, game, changes. game changes. But if it's yep. you know, a bread and butter series. Yep. So the sweet spot is that kind of bread and butter series and everybody in every network can calculate, knows internally what that sweet spot is, what's a number that doesn't, uh, doesn't um, ask any questions. And then within that though there are different levels like as Gary just said there are signature series like uh, Planet Earth or A&E series America the Story <laughs> of Us that was budgeted at about 1.3 million an hour. And uh, so each network has these tentpole programs or which could be quarterly or, or annually or whatever that are seasonal promotions that they tie their overall network um, brand promotion to. And then, you know, there are still like high, higher price levels that networks will commit to, for instance, for a Sunday night for a, a, you know, a very, or for a very competitive viewing time. Let's, let's say it's one network. Let's say it's history. Right. So the signature program is America, the story of us. The premium and high, that would be maybe their two-hour specials yep. on, a, on a Sunday night, yep. right? And then the sweet spot, that's, dog, or that's uh, Ice Road Truckers. I think Ice Road Truckers more would come signature. in. More signature. It comes in, yeah, more at the signature level. And also, remember, Ice Road Truckers is produced by a premium producer who has a tremendous track record of success and therefore has the opportunity to present a series to multiple networks and can charge a premium because they're on in the they're in a competitive environment. By the way, that particular uh, producer, Tom Beers, uh, of Original Productions, uh, he was once asked, "How do you make? Uh, how do you get rich in television?" He said, "Buy real estate." <laughs> <laughs> He's done very well. Peter, what's the low? Like a modern Marvel? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, okay. something that's heavily Bread and formatted. Butter thing. Yep. Okay. Please excuse me, I just want us to get all this information in uh, in the time we have. So, so now then we looked at some of the uh, price points for Discovery and um, the, Disco the Discovery's big four. You know, Showcase, again, you know, they can pay a million and a half for uh, BBC co-productions and some of their bigger major projects. A high would be something like a Shark Week special that drives the really important Shark Week promotion and that involves you know, very difficult location shooting and so on, and then their sweet spot and their, and their low, and so on with the other channels. I think own the, op, uh, the Oprah Winfrey Network is in a really interesting strategic situation right now. I've posted on this. It's very hard to get a read on what's going on there, but it would, you know, my hunch is that the Oprah Winfrey Network, which just uh, 
just uh, received a commitment of another $90 million in funding, $89 million from Discovery, is investing more in daytime because they announced a big uh, agreement with, um, with Rosie O'Donnell. We've heard that that's in the tens of millions of dollars and it would seem to me with Oprah also committing to hosting a show there that there's a bigger commitment to daytime. Any Anything questions, else? Gary? No, no, any questions on any of that, any of the numbers? You got to keep these numbers in mind. Uh, we, we've worked with a number of producers. Yeah, Denise. So for the open numbers, you have 350, so it's $250,000 per episode? Per hour, yeah, right? Per hour. Per hour. Yeah, all those are hours. And, and each, that would be for Prime, yeah. presumably. Actually, that number is uh, Oprah's announced the, uh, the Oprah Winfrey, inf excuse me, the Oprah Winfrey Documentary Club, which was to acquire 12 cinematic documentaries. And then there was a, a recent announcement that of those 12, five were going to be celebrity-driven two-hour specials hosted by Marielle Hemingway. Um, oh, I have, geez, I'm having a little moment here. So Julia, Julia Roberts, of course, I'm right. sorry. So those are priced round about $350,000 an hour, they're two hour specials, so the total budget, is, I believe, is in the $700,000 range. John, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, but for the indie producer, though, producing sure. a first time show, I feel like I get overwhelmed in that point. There's no way they're getting that budget. So for, let's say, the daytime stuff, what are they looking at for the budget? You know what? Um, Round ab I'd say round about the 150 to 200 uh, dollar, uh, dollar range, but we're ne really not certain what the um, what the daytime program you programming you will make, be. You could make a court series, mm -hmm. not that they're going to, but you could spend what less than a half a million a week, right, for five one hours. For, for five one hours, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. about right. So that's a little high for daytime, but o Oprah is yes. Yeah, yeah. but but I, not that I'm doubting your numbers at all, Peter. I think it's probably true. They are doubling down on that space. Right. right. But with a very um, erratic, confusing set of announcements. <laughs> Their first programming announcement was this documentary club. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would have led with that. I would have led with Oprah's retiring and she's going to do something for us. You know, right. That sort of thing. Uh, any questions? Any other questions? I would I would say also that each number that I've uh, that I'm sharing with you here should have a plus slash minus afterwards, uh, because you know there's a range of which this is is. Uh, and, and you always want to push that envelope, but don't push it too far. That's that's the key. Let's get your perspective on this, John. Yeah, you, so I, you go in knowing all of this. Right. Um, how do you then put together a budget that is going to meet those needs, but also run Burrard Films. Right. Part, well, part of it is whether you're doing a co-pro or you're doing a commission. And if you're doing a co-pro, you want to try and at least get a good portion of your budget covered by the network, which would be anywhere from 60 to 65 percent on a co-pro level. Oh, can you Here hear me now? Go. Okay. And then you need to partner up with, you know, somebody like Gary and Cable Ready so they can hopefully help that deficit. But, but I found if you're doing a program and you know that sweet spot per hour is around 250, you don't push it to 320, you push it to 270 and see how far you can push it. But you, you try not to go over that edge of where they're going to say no immediately. And these guys at the network level now, these, uh, the people who are charged with this production side, they, I don't think I've ever seen a finer tooth comb. No, and In they, look at, they look at every line item now. Where These they, budgets they aren't going up together. either, are they, Peter? No. Uh -uh. They're pretty flat, and they've been at this level five years, right. maybe, John? Yeah, in fact, some of them have gone down a little bit, too. Right. Yeah. Now, the good news is there are more networks than ever before. Right. That's the good news. But um, the, the per-episode um, fee hasn't really gone up much, if at all. So, John, yeah. can I, you said that the network would put down 60%? Mm -hmm. 60 to 65 percent. And that's for on a, U.S. On a copro. On a that's copro, for, that's, that's for U.S. For U.S. Right. and all the other digital and ancillary and, you know. They'll generally get rights. the U.S. ancillary rights, as right. John said. Maybe they'll get North America. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. then you get distribution rights beyond that. Uh, depending on their level of investment, you might, um, 
you might get some rights back in a territory. Well, you, might, you, might, you might try, as an example, to try and get French-speaking Canada back. Right. Or which ain't a bad no, turf to have, because you can pick up a few. But up. in my studies, uh, the, the uh, message that, I'm, uh, that I've increasingly received over the years from all the networks, particularly, say, A&E, uh, the A&E family of networks, but also Discovery, is that we want to fully commission a project and own it in its entirety, in perpetuity. Is that not your experience, or do you fall outside that range? I think I fall outside that range just because of the long relationship that I've had. But that is that is where they're going, right. especially with new producers. And and you don't go into an A&E or a history without knowing that that's what's probably going to happen. Right. Now, in some cases, um, and again, this has a lot to do with experience and past performance, you may be able to close a deal in a major territory like the UK or Asia or Australia or something, depending on your subject matter, then that gives you leverage when you walk into some networks to say, but I've already sold the UK, so it can't be a commission. And of course, the flip side of that is the network says, yeah, okay, well, we want to own it, so thanks anyway, <laughs> see you later. You know. So again, a lot of this depends on, on your leverage at that particular moment, right? Right. So that brings me to the question, if you're an, a new producer and you have project, a project f for which you have some positive feedback in the industry and the moment comes when you're getting ready to pitch it to a channel, the, my question is should you pitch it individually yourself, just find the commissioning editor at NATPI or at another uh, a, a event or try and make an appointment with the channel? Or should you go through another party like a cable radio distributor or a John Burrard who is a producer who has all the contacts in place? Or what, an agent. Or an, or an, or agent. an agent, that's yeah. the third one. So of those three <coughs> general options, or well, I guess there's four, agent, distributor, see, uh, experienced producer, or do it yourself, what should you do? Well, I, I'm not. I, I would say that agent maybe is not the the best way because they're going to take you ultimately to probably another production company. Uh, certainly, a distributor is good to talk to, and a production company because then you have a showrunner in the production company, and you have a distributor that might be bringing international money to the table. Mm -hmm. So, I think ideally that would be the best scenario for an independent producer. Doing it yourself can be very difficult. In fact, some networks won't even allow it unless you Unless come you have in. an agent or, a, or an attorney that's right. your representative. That they've done business with. Some networks don't want to do business with anyone they haven't done business with right. in some way, shape, or form. Um, if you have the contacts, if you've done something for a particular network um, at a previous company you were at, you can probably get someone's ear at that network. But for the most part, if you're in it on your own, you either better have a lot of information from guys like DocumentaryTV.com and CableU.TV. Um, you need that just for starters to find out. Just the for who. starters, and you need to hit all the markets. Absolutely, you need to be visible. You need to belong to stuff like this. And a lot of producers say, oh, "Man, you know what? I just want to create. That's all I want to do. I don't want to have to sell it." Okay, so that's when you desperately need someone to sell it for. On the other hand, after they sell it for you for a while, I don't think you know everything and you don't need them anymore. Right. <laughs> because that happens too. We got a question right here. Being in the position that Peter referred to a moment ago, that juncture where I have a good enough pitch package together and there's interest being expressed, I've got enough experience to sort of know the game. But I'm looking at going in by myself or partnering with a production company like John. Well, again, I, I think that that formula, it depends, will you be actively producing the program as well? Because a lot of the producers that come to me um, that look for my company to show run their idea are producers that have either worked for me or, or know of me, and they have experience producing. And a lot of time what they're looking for is a six-month gig to 
to use their producing skills. So, so there's a percentage on top of having a job for six months to say a year if you sell the series. So there's that aspect of it too. But either way, if you, if you have great contacts and can get directly in, that's one thing. But if you can't and you go into the network, they're going to for sure hook you up with somebody that they know can complete a show for if them. If they really, really like the if idea. If they really love the idea, yeah. absolutely. But again, cultivate those uh, relationships. All right, so we've, we've walked through the research, what you do before you set the, uh, before you even finish your development process. You've now put some ideas down in a paper. You've made it into something kind of fancy. And by the way, don't show off your pros. Get to the point. Uh, if, if a buyer can't figure out in the first paragraph what that show is all about, you're dead right in the water. Right? Uh, that and also I would say don't, don't fall in love with your pitch. Be ready to, to change your pitch while you're pitching. We are constantly trying to reduce the number of words in everything we present. Right. And pictures help too. Right. Consider your audience. Now, uh, speaking of pictures that you have to do in these things. Um, at this uh, Westdoc conference we were at, I, I, I wrote a 24-word entry to the Cable U blog today. Characters, 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 characters times six. Right. That was it. It was a hammered home. And the snookier, the better, I'm uh -huh. afraid. Absolutely. Now, you know, there will be some exceptions to that. I hope so, because we have a show that goes in the opposite direction. But at any rate, this is what everyone is looking for. Um, so if you have an idea, boy, if it's built around a character or a set of characters, and as, some, as a couple people said today, if those characters are bipolar, so much the better. The better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if that were the case, I'd have had a series a long time ago. <laughs> you and me both. Yeah, all right, good. Um, but what I want to show you is some of the various degrees of a teaser tape. Now, uh, Cable Ready with uh, the production company Buck Productions, out of Canada, um, Buck came to us with an idea. Not an idea, actually a guy. A guy who runs a tire store in suburban Maryland. And uh, in doing his genealogical testing, it led him to England where he was sponsored and not, not protested against. And long story short, he's the 12th cousin of the Queen of England and the rightful heir and the uh, once and future king of the Isle of Man. No kidding. So the conversation was, do we do some sort of a teaser tape? Do we show what the, what the program will be about? But we said, you know what? You either buy into this guy or you don't. You either like the character and you get the concept. I mean, the concept's pretty easy to figure out. You know, that who do you think you are concept? It's, this is really like, who the hell do you think you are? Um, so this is what uh, we asked the production company to do. Take one of those little mini video cameras and uh, give, it to, give it to the guy and have him tell his own story. So we got something for you right now that is what we first pitched this program. And uh, the program is called King Dave. <laughs> Well, good morning. I'm uh, David Howe. I uh, live in Frederick, Maryland, and uh, I am a average, normal, everyday family guy. Live here with my wife Pam, my daughter Grace. I'm also a, a tire store manager, uh, and we sell quality tires at reasonable prices. And when I'm not doing that, I am also the uh, king of the Isle of Man. And uh, they call me King Dave. Um, and uh, that's my that's my story. Um, all happened a few years back. Uh, supporters found me, um, promoted me to the Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, who is also my cousin. Uh, they uh, published my claim in the London Gazette. I went to London. I was invested into a, uh, a Knights Templar group. Uh, was crowned the king. Um, so pretty different kind of stuff you don't expect to see every day. Um, wanted to show you guys a couple of things that you might find interesting. Um, this is, uh, I became a member of a pretty prestigious organization made up of uh, royals and nobles. And this is, uh, it's called the Royal Confraternity of Sao Teotonio. And it's run by the Portuguese royal family. 
uh, King of Rwanda is a member, uh, Prince David of the Republic of Georgia. Uh, of course, they uh, said, Prince David, you are a Grand Cross of Justice in the organization, signed and stamped and all that kind of cool stuff. It's all in Portuguese, uh, which I don't read too well. They gave me this uh, sash, which is really neat. And I was thinking about wearing it when I sell tires. And uh, that's the breast metal they gave me. Uh, some other metals here. Um, so, interesting stuff. Uh, I, I, I have friends and supporters on the island, of course. And one of, uh, one of them sent me a letter. I, I've done a few radio interviews. And, and this one comes from Fred the Manx. And it says, uh, it says from a proud Manxman. And it says, uh, King Dave, you're going to take my hard-earned tax money. Well, I have something else for you, too. And then you see Fred, a very heartfelt look on his face. Looks like a hard-working guy. And then you see he's saying I'm number one. And he's doing it with both hands, which I think is really kind of nice. And, uh, and it says, that goes for your cousin Queen Liz, too. And I wasn't sure if he'd sent that uh, email to her, so I went ahead and forwarded it over to her. Um, you know, because that's what you do. It, I don't know, you know. So anyway, uh, I work at Mr. Tire, as you can see. I have to sell tires today. Today, if you buy any four radials, I will uh, give you an audience with the king. Um, you know, one per customer, no rain checks, not to be combined with any other offers. So, uh, see you there. Thanks, guys. Freddie the Manx. Alrighty, you get it, right? Pretty self-explanatory. Uh, those of you on the web, if you're watching that, and anyone here, we'd love your comments. We're still in the process of pitching this and closing the deal, so I'll consider this our own focus group here. John, have you done those sorts of uh, videos before these teasers, and how do you execute them? Uh, not exactly like that, because I didn't have King Dave. But <laughs> uh, Only we do. <laughs> Only you do. Uh, most of ours are, are two to three minute uh, kind of sizzle reels that very fast um, give, give the buyer images of of what the show and the concept are all about and try and do it in as as quickly as you can because the time frame that these guys have is like this much so if, if you send it to them and then you have to once you send it to them you have to email them 50 times to make sure they viewed it because it's been sitting on their desk for three weeks so it's, that's about what we do right Peter what's your uh, impression of all this um, Dying to ask a question, I can tell. Yeah, look, I guess, you know, the, the, the critical question for me me about uh, a sizzle reel is who actually gets to watch it when you, when you send it in? How do you control the viewing process? I mean, there, there are... Well, you try not to send it in, for one. You try to be there as best you can to control the environment. But I've got to be honest, that's tougher and tougher all the time. It's tougher. Everyone is so busy. No one has any time for anything. Uh, <laughs> Stop warning. It, 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 it is tougher, and I think that's why, uh, like a company such as ourselves that have a long relationship with these guys, we're sending it to the guy or gal that can say yes. Right. And y usually you don't have to be there. It's always better to be there, right. but you don't have to be there. And Now, do you, you send a DVD or a link these days? Do we do a link. We do yeah, a link. We do a link, uh, yeah. yeah. The old days you used to But they to must be getting two or three hundred emails a day. Wouldn't well, they you, lose the You never want to send it. You'd prefer not to send it blind. You should have some sort of a conversation first. Tell them it's coming or some sort of an email sort of teasing them. Right. Um, I tell you, you know, it's a good time to learn how to write a, le a good letter, isn't it? Yeah. You know, more than any other time probably since colonial days, writing a, a good letter email well thought out well executed not all chummy with you know letters short, instead of words and very short right what, that, three, two or three paragraphs yeah three, i wouldn't go yeah, more than that yeah, yeah, i if, wouldn't if that so you're pitching a show or a series with two or three paragraphs and a link it, if that and hopefully a conversation over the right. phone if you can't be there in person a conversation over the phone where you can actually give your micro pitch and if they like it then you say, okay, I'll send you a link, and then you send the link, and then you follow up and follow up and follow up. I come from the days of TV syndication. Rick, you'll remember these wonderful days, Denise, you too, when uh, you would go into a city, 
you'd have a meeting with every channel there, you'd have a major presentation, the meeting took an hour and a half, everyone from programming to management to sales to promotion was in the meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, while you may not have gotten an answer at that moment, you had everyone who was involved in the decision in the room. That's almost impossible these days. Though when you get it, you know that's a good sign. When I went to the UK with King Dave, trust me, everyone was in the meeting, which was kind of neat. Yeah, but, but still, As the king would say, kind of good stuff. Uh, it markets like NatBee or RealScreen, you can hopefully set a meeting with the executive and, and some of their entourage, sit down and pitch them seven or eight ideas, see what their read is on it, and, and they'll say, oh, we really like this one, and that's the one that you go back to the office, rush and put together a sizzle reel, and all the rest of the stuff, so. Uh, we, we are taking questions. We'll be taking some from the audience here in just a couple minutes. But we do have one online uh, from, I believe, Stickam. Uh, that's our person. He says, do you, he or she says, do you get further with a pitch, excuse me, with a pitch when you professionally produce a teaser? Good timing, Stickham, because that's the second video we want to show you. This is a production company that has not done a primetime show. They've never really done a program that's been sold anywhere. We got to know them through the emerging producer competition that, Nat P, that we run for NatPe, and they were... They finished in second place. Hmm. It's a company called Amp Productions out of Dallas. Now, why did they finish second place, and why was that interesting to us? Because they had a great presentation. John, you were there. Absolutely. It was just well thought out. Everything was great about it. They had the cast. They, des they described it perfectly, but it was about opera, and opera is death on television. You know, y you might as well run a horse uh, show with uh, fire. In it because those are like the three things nobody wants to run fire horses and opera but the concept was very well thought out. beautiful so we asked that they we said what else do you have what other ideas do you have and they came to us with a two-word title and they then started to shoot a teaser which cable ready assisted them with really shortening it down creating some tension and this is the video you're gonna see right now again it's amp productions out of Dallas and uh, the show is called dream detectives There was a lot of anger. In this dream, I always have to kill someone. And my mom walks in. And when I woke up, I was definitely feeling the fear. But the dream is telling me I was going to die. Makes me wonder. What's happening? I will relive those dreams again and again and again and again. I want to figure out what I can do to get past this. Everyone dreams. People often come to us wanting answers, wanting to know more about what their dreams mean. Because dreams give us insight into what's going on in our mind during the day, it's so helpful to have someone who can decipher those messages and then give people a direction to take. Every dream is a mystery. Every dream is a crime scene photo. And we're investigators. We investigate dreams so we can understand what they mean. We're really like dream detectives. All right, I think we can, uh, we can probably pause this one. What you would then see where we do continue this, in the interest of time, we're going to, we're going to, uh, no, we're not going to pause it. Okay, there, that's great. Guys, um, what you would see after this is a simulated uh, show, act by act. We, did, uh, we had them do three different acts, which was basically the setup, what's the dream itself. Um, number two, the second act was uh, basically what did it mean. And then the third act will be the intervention into the dream to try and, and uh, help them stop this problem. So we're out with that. But that's an example of an independent production company never done anything and I'll tell you if you were to see this whole thing and you can on the cableready.net website it's kick ass it is real kick ass so, so Gary how much did you spend on it they spent under 10,000 on this but they had all the you know the stuff in house but I'll tell you this cableready productions 
did a little presentation, teaser, for an idea that we had called Intersections that we talked about earlier. We did it for $3,000. Right. Now, in the end, the show was budgeted at under 100000 So, I mean, we knew going in this wasn't going right. to buy us the real estate that Tom Beers has. But nonetheless, <laughs> you've got to do it these days. you just got to. If you have talent, you got to do it. If you've never done anything else before, you got to do it. Right. Um, and how long did it take from your green lighting the production of this sizzle reel to delivery? What was the timeline? To delivery of the first episodes? The delivery, of the, delivery of the sizzle reel itself. How long did it take to make the sizzle reel? Probably a month on this one because we were going back and forth with them. They sent us about, I would say, the first one was 10 minutes long. And it was a lot. It opened cold with the people sort of talking about their dreams. But it was like a minute yeah, on each first, one. First-time you know? producers tend to do that. Yeah, you get hung up on, like you said earlier, you get hung up on the pitch. What about you, John? When you do a sizzle reel, how long do you take? Uh, to produce it? Yeah. Uh, probably two or three weeks. Uh -huh. yeah. And how much would you typically invest in? A about the same. But again, because we have a production company, it's all internal. So right. These people are already on staff and... In terms of hard dollars, maybe five to ten grand. Yeah. Let's uh, go to the audience here. If there's any questions here, we have a few more from online. By the way, I've been informed Stickum is a delivery service <laughs> on uh, that thing called the Internet, which is very, <laughs> I don't know where the wires are on these things. Uh, anyway, any questions? Yes, please. What would be the running time on your sizzle reel? Uh, death, death. Yeah, two, two to three minutes, yeah. max. But, and then sometimes, like in a project like this, the network will want to see what a potential act will look like within the show. So you'll do a second reel that's not a sizzle reel. It's more of a demo. And that will have part sizzle, but it'll actually go into a little bit of the body of the show to, to show characters, for example. As Gary said, characters are so important now. You want to really show characters. That takes time. You can't do that in a sizzle reel. And the second step can be that the networks themselves will kick in. We'll fund that. Yeah. Twenty, forty thousand, for you to do a longer presentation that really fleshes out that act. Or but ten to fifteen thousand. <laughs> <laughs> and how often does that does that happen? Do, that that you that the networks actually arrange some kind of comp compensation your for your development. Your percentage is always fifteen percent. It's the law of 15%. 15% of the pitches uh, turn up into the next step of an act by act or a budget. 15% of those go to some sort of presentation or pilot. 15% of those get picked up for a series. And, and I think percent of those get renewed. You know, so and and, so and so. I think it also has to do again with, with, uh, with characters. If you've got characters like this show does or some of the stuff that we've done, those are the ones that they usually want to see more. And sometimes they'll, they'll trust you to, to produce a show or a pilot or a series, but usually they want to see a little bit more about the characters to see if they fit with the network. All right, here's a couple more from the web. Is it a good idea to bring storyboards into a documentary pitch, John? Never done it. Yeah, me neither. Peter, you know. I'm, spend the money for the video, for crying out loud. You've got to do absolutely. it. Absolutely. You know, if, if you're going to come in with, anyway, you get it. Uh, if my pitch changes significantly during a meeting, are the executives going to take the idea and move forward without me? Pretty good chance. Um, and the only way around that is to, John? There, there is no way around that. It's, it's happened to me many times. Uh, you know, not that I can point directly to it. But, but if your program depends on a talent, you different. better sign the talent. You have to sign that talent before you go in for the pitch. If it depends on a book, own the book. So the more you go in owning that idea, concept, or whatever, the better off you're going to be. Anyone can do a show about women in prison. John does Women Behind Bars, three seasons worth. But, you know, he's, he's got that kind of a track record with that kind of program. Peter, you're going to say something? Yeah, I was, um, actually, move ahead. I'll come back to the okay. question later. Sure. Uh, but, 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 but. So anyway, own, own the idea. Uh, finally, this question from the web, and maybe there will be more. We still have 10 minutes. I pitched a show to a network a few years ago. Can I pitch to that same network again the same pitch? 
Yes. Has and the personnel changed? Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and here's why. In three years, the same people it's, are probably they're not gone. there. Yeah. But not just that. Needs change. Ideas change. Uh, perceptions of the network change. My story on that was years ago, Bosch Media and Murphy Entertainment Group in Madison, Wisconsin, of all places, um, wanted to do a show called Wildlife Detectives, Forensics in, in the Wild. And we could get Nat Geo International to pony up about 50% of the budget for most of the world, but not the U.S. We couldn't get the U.S. to buy into it, okay? So then we, um, we pitched this thing around, and you know, we were able to launch the show, and I went into Animal Planet with it so many times. They finally said, Gary, you know, we really like you a lot, but if you bring up wildlife detectives again, I swear we're going to throw you out of the office, okay? <laughs> Fine, okay, I get it. You, know, you don't have to tell me seven times. So, uh, I don't know, six months later, I get a call from Bill Graff, who was programming Animal Planet at the time. He said, I want you to know we don't stand on our orthodoxy. I said, what the hell does that mean? He says, uh, we want to buy wildlife detectives. So just pay attention to what the network is doing, what their needs are, what right. their schedule is, and so on, and you may detect some sort of a, of a sea change, right? Classic. How many, people, how many networks turn down uh, porn stars? Seven or eight. Depends on the year and the regime. There was a time when Discovery said, uh, "If you're going to sell anything to Nat Geo around the world, we don't want it." Um, fast forward to 2009. Cable Ready sells a Christmas special produced for Nat Geo to TLC in the United States. Oh, it already ran and yeah, but that happens, you know? Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Runs on FX and uh, Comedy Central all Monday night, so. So returning to, to talent, I mean, we talked at the beginning of the presentation that these are times where character-driven television is king. And a minute ago you said, S make sure you've signed up the talent, that the character is yours before you pitch it. Now, what does that, in what, kind of agreements do you insist on uh, in order to feel secure moving forward with the talent? John, you're the guy on that. Uh, well, sometimes you need a full contract. Sometimes if it's talent, um, we're doing a show now with a celebrity talent mm -hmm. and a, a letter of intent from their agent for a certain period of time, option period is sufficient. And what would be a, t a typical option period? Six to eight months. Mm -hmm. To pay them yeah. anything? Nope. Nope. And if you find the new dog, the bounty hunter, or the new cake boss, or just some working A class. A simple three-page contract just to, to tie them up, get, get them to agree to pitch your show, and they can't go anywhere else. Yeah. We pitched a show a bunch of years ago called Bad to the Bone. It was pre-Dog Whisperer, and it was a real funky sort of uh, dog training. It wasn't a salon. It looked like a bar, and in fact, there was a bar for dogs in this place. So, um, and the, the guys were like, the, the, the woman and the man that ran it were like biker people, you know? Really cool. Pitched the show, bidding war. One of those great moments in sales life, you know? They hadn't signed the talent. So I had a deal with Nat Geo, and all of a sudden the talent thinks it's going to be Steve Irwin, Martha Stewart, and Rachel Ray wrapped up into one in terms of future licensing and everything. They demanded final cut on the program. These were stupid dog trainers in Chicago that didn't have enough money for clean clothes, for crying out loud, and they want to control the action figures and lunch boxes. <laughs> I called up John Ford at Nat Geo at the time. I said, John, we're killing the show. We're killing the show. This thing is going to unravel so bad that by the time it gets to the point where you guys have thrown up your hand, it'll be too late. So I'm going to save you all that aggravation now. Never, you ever heard of these guys? You never heard of them. <laughs> right. Questions in here? Any others here, sir? Yep. Nobody? If you are a talent, you should have an agent, I think. Um, it depends on, on who the talent is. It's, if it's a, a, a well-known celebrity talent, but if you found the next great chef and they're just a great character, you don't want an agent involved. You, Everybody you wants to tie uh, them up without. Right, no, known. No, yeah, you want to go through their agent. Yeah, and you'll need uh, definitely some proof that you've signed them up. Right, right. But I will tell you that 
a lot of the programs now, a lot of the buyers, they don't necessarily want celebs unless you're, you know, falling off the edge um, or you're Gene Simmons, yeah, you know. You, you can get snooky in the first season, snooky in the first season for beer and chips. So Go why down to the mall, you know. I mean, <laughs> you'll, you'll have everyone you want and some you don't. Another question from that Internet thing. I don't have an agent. Should I consult a lawyer before making an attempt to pitch a developed project? Um, you ought to know a lawyer at this point Absolutely, at any rate, yes. I think. Yeah. And I know you're going to be afraid of someone stealing that idea. Um, you know, the best you can hope for is maybe a non-disclosure somewhere. But um, And sometimes the network will, requ will require that you have an attorney as your representative to go in and pitch. Right. So kind of a simple answer, but yes, it helps to have an attorney. Yes. And by the way, excuse me, Denise, an attorney is different from an agent, okay? Agents can look at a contract, but an attorney can guide you and advise you on that. At Cable Ready, we've seen a lot of contracts, so we rarely use our attorney, but we, we have an attorney. Denise, I'm sorry. You just pick up the phone, make the deal. <laughs> <laughs> Collect your I thought check. I made that clear. <laughs> well, after that is when you know, when you find out how resilient you are to the negative forces that produce the word no, uh, because that's what it's about. So at that point, you're putting everything into action, right? Yep. You're taking the research, the analysis, what you know about the character, what your unique hook is on this particular topic. Um, who you're going to ally yourself with, are you going to customize that pitch for that network, you set up the best possible plan you have, and then you throw that out the window because it won't matter. It'll, right. it'll take on a life of its own and, <laughs> as soon and, as and you then, go and out. the network will have 10 different committee meetings and you know, ask you 20 different things. You and hope. That's why you, I mean, you hope. And you right. hope. And yeah. that's why you want to t tie up your talent because talent, especially if it's not a celebrity, if it's, you know, again, like the greatest cook or the pet doctor or whatever it is, y y you want them tied up because 30, 40, 50 days, they start getting antsy. And, you know, I got a call from a, my yeah. neighbor who said he knows a producer. And, and oh, well, he will bring deal, me in to see Nancy that. Dubuque. Um, make sure you know uh, whether or not that buyer wants to see the talent in the first meeting because sometimes that can kill it. I'm getting the wrap up sign. We could go on for a long time. Maybe we will privately when that internet thing shuts off. It signs off about midnight, doesn't it, Rick? At any rate, I want to thank uh, Peter Hamilton, DocumentaryTV.com, John Bird, Bird Films, thank you. and uh, I'm Gary Lico, CableU.TV, etc. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks for turning on your computer. Bye. Come to Miami for NatPay. <laughs>